We live in an angry world. You know, really, we live in a grudge-filled world. And we struggle to balance the desire for justice and the hope of a better world for everyone with the ever-present theme of revenge and punishment. And I think it begs the question, can we ever really heal? And does healing require inflicting injuries on those who have hurt us? And I think many of us are looking for hope and for answers that enable us to go forward. The Old Testament reading for this week is about just a little bit of that struggle, but I'd like to read that passage from Genesis chapter 50, beginning with the 15th verse, and then tie a little bit to the Matthew passage. Um, that I'm not going to read the Matthew passage, but, but I think it's familiar enough people to know what I'm talking about. But let me read Genesis 15, it's verse, or chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. And it's very near the end of the book of Genesis. And it goes like this. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they went, sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before them, before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. I think when we deal with the issue of forgiveness, real forgiveness, it's hard for us on any level. And maybe sometimes it's hard for us to forgive because if we look at some of the wrongs we've done in our lives, it's maybe sometimes it's hard for us to imagine that we've really been forgiven. Now, Joseph's brothers are in this time of grief following their father's passing, but they express that grief in possibly the worst way. They immediately decide that their brother, Joseph, has just been waiting for their dad to pass so he can get some payback. I think we understand this. A lot of people will do some things while their parents are alive, but they immediately stop when their parents are gone. And family relationships change a lot when the patriarch or the matriarch leading that family passes away power shifts around and there is kind of a need to find the new normal for a family. So Joseph's brothers think up a lie. I, I mean, we kind of have to assume that because we're not told that Jacob actually ever said any of this. Dad's last words, they tell their brother, were, don't hurt your brothers. And Joseph hears their words and weeps. And they come in and throw themselves down and proclaim themselves his servants. And, and this is weird. I mean, why do they think he's weeping? Is, is it because it, it, they're thinking in his mind he isn't going to get to kill them if he buys into the story they're telling? You know, I think he weeps because they still think he's hungry for revenge. And that somehow it just kind of breaks his heart how he's realizing right now that they see him. He responds, though, with a faith perspective that they really lack. They did evil. They meant evil. And they did it to him. But God is bigger than their plan, their intentions, and their actions. God repurposes their evil into something good. Now, they were still wrong. And they did wrong. And God allowed their choice but God took control of the outcome. God made their evil serve his salvation. You know, that sounds a lot like the cross of Jesus, doesn't it? Joseph doesn't go through the words of forgiving them again. He says that's not his business, nor is punishing them 
He believes that God is the main character in this story. The brothers keep making it about themselves, but Joseph is deeply aware that he is part of something bigger. Now, in Matthew 18, Peter comes to Jesus and asks how many times he has to forgive another member of the church. He wants to know what the cutoff point on forgiveness is. When has he done all the forgiveness that he is required to do to be okay with Jesus? I mean, Peter gets life. I mean, he understands some things. He's, he knows people hurt me, and it goes deep. Sometimes people hurt people I care about, and that can run deeper still. How forgiving do I really have to be? I mean, surely God only expects so much of this forgiveness stuff. So Peter puts his number out there, and he thinks seven is pretty good. You know, in fact, from Peter's perspective, forgiving somebody seven times would be pretty abundant grace. And Jesus immediately says, well, let's try 77. And I think Peter maybe just looked at Jesus with sheer disbelief. You know, sometimes when I talk to people about forgiveness, it's interesting in discussions of forgiveness how people with, will share things that they already know or have decided, almost like they even have a plan, that they will never forgive those things if they are done to them or someone in their family. It's like planned failure in the area of forgiveness. You know, I, I think maybe we should have some times that we would say if we were looking toward these possibilities that it would really take all the grace God has to give for us to be able to forgive in that situation. But that's not what people say. People have already made some choices and have a little list of things that they would never forgive. And we look at this parable of Jesus in Matthew 18, and it would seem to assume that God has already forgiven us more than any one thing that we would ever have to forgive someone for having done to us. And this parable even suggests that if we harbor unforgiveness in our hearts, that it makes us responsible for all of our wrongs before God. You know, it's kind of scary. It makes it sound like that our forgiven debts would be reinstated. You know, what is forgiveness to us? I guess that's really a big question. Medical science has already begun to think about these issues and about the emotional and physical dangers and even damage of holding on to past hurts and resentments. When we hold on to deeply felt grudges, they don't hurt the ones that we carry them against. They actually physically and emotionally and even spiritually hurt us. You know, that spiritual danger is that they will create a barrier between us and God. We can't wall our hearts off with anger or rage or resentment, hurts that we refuse to let be healed without having that wall around our hearts begin to keep God out also. You know, why do we hold on to things? There are a lot of different things that go around in us when we're wrestling with hurts and the things that have been done to us. Sometimes, sometimes we really wish inside that we could hurt them back. Sometimes maybe we just think they should have to do something, say something to make it better or repay that wrong somehow, and then we can wrestle with letting it go. Or, or maybe like sometimes we feel like forgiving humbles us, lessens us somehow. Maybe we don't have a deep enough sense of how much God has forgiven us. That's kind of what Jesus suggests in his parable. Forgiveness does not mean pretending it never happened. Forgiveness does not deny that we've been hurt. And it, honestly, we can't just cover up wrongs. We have to admit to ourselves that we have been hurt and we have to be honest about it. Forgiveness doesn't mean we forget what was done and allow those kind of wrongs to happen over and over again endlessly. Some things have to be addressed. They have to be confronted, and they have to be made to stop. And sometimes there are consequences 
for wrongs that have been done to us or to others. And sometimes, even if relationships can be restored, that trust takes time. Sometimes things just have to be done to make sure that really bad hurts never happen again. And and I think we all would understand that forgiveness must never be a weapon for victimizers to use against their victims to ensure their future ability to create more victims. What does forgiveness mean? Forgiveness means that we have to be freed somehow of the rage and the resentment and the desire for payback. It doesn't mean that people who hurt others don't face consequences. It means that we let go deep down inside of our need to want those consequences and our need to live in anger and resentment. It ultimately has to mean that their power over us is broken. We have to believe that we can be freed of mental and emotional slavery to the people who hurt us. Sometimes it may mean that we forego repayment or consequences, but it may also mean that when repayment or consequences are necessary, we pursue them without anger, without hatred, or desire to return hurt for hurt. Whatever happens, even with whatever must be done, we need to be free deep in our hearts. There's a rabbi named Harold Kushner who told a story in an article he wrote in 1999, and I think it's a really good, um, it it just provides some help with this. And, And here's what he wrote. He said, a woman in my congregation comes to see me. She is a single mother, divorced, working to support herself and her three young children. She says to me, since my husband walked out on us, every month is a struggle to pay our bills. I have to tell my kids we have no money to go to the movies while he is living it up with his new wife in another state. How can you tell me to forgive him? I answer her, he writes. I'm not asking you to forgive him because what he did was acceptable. It wasn't. It was mean and selfish. I'm asking you to forgive him because he doesn't deserve the power to live in your head and turn you into a bitter, angry woman. I'd like to see him out of your life emotionally as completely as he is out of it physically, but you keep holding on to him. You're not hurting him by holding on to that resentment, but you're hurting yourself. We have to believe that we can be free of mental and emotional slavery to the people who hurt us. The beginning is found according to Jesus in this passage in Matthew when we know how forgiven we are how God knows every wrong whether in thought or action and wipes away our whole rotten list blessed are the poor in spirit Jesus said in Matthew 5 the ones who never forget how much they need that grace because Jesus says that theirs the ones who know that deep down inside, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, I had to do something this week. I have to do it from time to time. And, and I can just say, carrying water softener salt is a pain. You get a 50-pound sack of that salt, and you, got, you get it in each hand, and they have those thin plastic handles that cut into your palm and you carry it with one in each hand down to the basement and so you've got that extra hundred pounds that you're dragging and carrying and and it's trying to pull you down those steps but you know you finally get to the other end of the basement and you set that weight down and you realize that weight is gone And suddenly you walk with the bouncing gait of someone whose burden has been taken away. That is what Jesus died to give us spiritually. And when we embrace hurts and anger and resentment and we nurse a grudge, we're choosing to tie those weights on our back and carry them forever. Jesus died to make us free. 
And so we need to seek to live free. Can we pray together? God, help us to live the freedom you died to give. When we hold on to hurts, when we hold on to anger, when we nurse a grudge, when we refuse to forgive, we don't hurt the person we're angry at. We hurt ourselves and we damage our closeness with you. Make us deeply aware of how much grace we've been given and of the joy we found when you wiped our slate clean. And help us to value your presence so deeply and realize how much grace it took to make it real that we will seek and find in you the freedom to release the things that bind us, the hurts, the grudges, the anger. Help us to find in you the release we need to be free. We're still going to have to sometimes stand up two people, four people. Sometimes we're even going to have to bring consequences into situations because of what people do to others. But we want to do it with the right heart, the right spirit, the right guidance from you and that we would have what Joseph had the trust that you are good and at work in all of it and we just have to love and trust you the way you have loved and accepted us help us to find the right path we pray in Jesus name amen I want to end with a few verses from Psalm 103 The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him to make that our blessing for this week. May your heart be shaped toward peace by the Lord's compassion, grace, and abundant love. May you know in your innermost self that his love for you is bigger than the universe around us. May you know that the stains on your heart and life have been moved as far away as the other side of the world. And finally, as you find yourself humbled before a loving father, may you know that he has always endless compassion for his children.